Hello again. You're still here. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I don't take for granted that you're still here. I'm very happy still to be here. Did I didn't tell you I went out this morning early, and even though it was dark, I saw a deer. Yeah. <laughs> Made me so happy. And I'm now looking forward to seeing an alligator. <laughs> no, is that not going to happen? You don't come to Florida just to see people. <laughs> I, I, if anyone can help me, I'd be delighted. Anyway, uh, that's not relevant to the title right now of going deeper, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, let me read where we've got to. And are you up for some more Lexio? And to be more inclusive, very appropriate given where we began this morning, I realized halfway through the Lexio, I apologize, I don't know where to, which camera to look at at this point, I apologize to the people online that I realized they couldn't hear you voicing words that spoke from scripture. I realized halfway through and I nearly jumped in by repeating what you said but that's what I am going to do this time. Please, like popcorn, keep voicing what you hear and I will repeat it. We just hear it twice, that's great, right? Yeah. It's all about listening to God's word, speaking to one another. And then to those who are following online, we have a new system. I have the iPad. If you would use that QR code that works for questions and answers at the end, just like everybody is doing, if you would use the QR code during the Lexio to say what is speaking to you from the text, I will read it out as we go along. And then others will benefit from the whole people of God listening to the word of God, not just the people present. Yeah? Does that sound okay? And where is Michelle? Is Michelle here? Yes, Michelle, just come sit in the front row so that you're ready. Michelle is going to be our second reader today. Michelle is from Barbados. And Mich you know, Michelle, Michelle reminded me that you can lie on a beach in Barbados and read God's word all at the same time. So let me not draw the false polarity ever again. Uh, Michelle is going to invite us all for the next clergy conference, I hope. Right. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Okay, where did we get to? Here we have verses 17 through 19, but I'm just going to start by recapping where we got to so we hear it all at one go. Then I will read these verses slowly. We will spend a couple of moment, couple of minutes in quiet, listening again to God speaking to us through these words. And then Michelle, uh, Michelle will come to the microphone, read them again. Then it's popcorn time. Got it? And then I'll probably get carried away again. Okay, shall we pray? Lord, after lunch, may your spirit agitate us, provoke us, keep us awake, keep our ears pinned back and our hearts open to listen to you speaking through your word, feeding our hearts, strengthening us in our inner beings, all of it for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For this reason, I bow, I, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long 
and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Oops. What have I done? I've broken something here. Let's be hearing. What's God speaking to you? Which words jump? Rooted. Rooted and established. Wide and long and high and deep. Multi-dimensional. Multi-dimensional, which surpasses knowledge from the, from online, the Lord's holy people. All the fullness, abundance, the love of Christ, completeness, rooted and established in love, how wide, to know this love, surpasses knowledge, surpasses knowledge, filled to the measure. Deep, all the Lord's holy people, 
power together. Together with. Love surpasses knowledge. The measure of all the fullness of God. And so here a person saying just the same thing. All the fullness of God. Grasp. Someone online says. Established in love. Together. To comprehend, to know. Overflowing. Holy. Power. This love. And I pray. The repetition of that you. And, 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 and. <laughs> Power to grasp. With all the saints. May have. Love it. I think we've covered, I just love the and 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 and. I think we've, <laughs> think we've actually covered every word there. <laughs> Isn't God good? <laughs> Will we get to the bottom of it? Our title today is Deeper. So, my overview, just in case you disappear after the first minute, <laughs> is this is all about love. This is all about love. Being rooted and established in love. Ability to grasp the dimensions of Christ's love. And then to know this love. That you may be filled with the fullness of God who is love. This is all about love. Love, love, love. Anyway, starting at the beginning. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. I just want to begin playing with those two verbs, rooted and established. We've got a favorite pair of metaphors there, both of which are about going deeper. Okay? We've got sketched through them, two pictures of security and stability. Pay attention whenever you find word pairs that get repeated. You'll know Old Testament prophets, you hear justice and righteousness, justice and righteousness, justice and righteousness all the time. In the New Testament, you get love and faithfulness. You get grace and truth, Romans. And in Paul, in Ephesians and Colossians, you get rooted and grounded. They're like salt and pepper, okay? They belong together. Twice in Colossians, we have Paul saying, provided that you continue securely, established and steadfast, that is founded and firm in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel you heard. That's Colossians 1. In Colossians 2, Paul urges the, con the Colossians to be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught. So these images, on the one hand, are horticultural, being rooted, and on the other hand, it, it's more architectural. It's more about buildings. Having roots that strike deep and having foundations firmly laid. <coughs> One is about trees, the other's about, well, trees, plants, the other's about buildings. 
So whether it's about a plant that grows organically or a structure that is man-made, the concern is about going deeper for stability, which is to say, I don't know if this is even a word, unmovableness. It is a word now. You know exactly what I mean. Paul is drawing from the roots and foundations of biblical tradition to say this. The one about the tree, the rooting, well, for me, I don't know about you, echoes Psalm 1. Yeah, you know that one? The wise and the wicked, or the happy and the foolish, depending on your translation. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. And then listen, they are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in due season, whose leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. <laughs> Reading out that in here in Florida, where your leaves do not wither, right? Right before they grow new. Oh, they do? You just don't do autumn. No. You don't do colors. But they still shed their leaves. Okay, okay, that's fine then. I, it still works. <laughs> I was a bit worried for a moment then. And let's think about this tree planted by streams of water for a moment. I just want to actually draw your attention to the logo of the Canterbury Centre. Isn't it wonderful? And I saw in the sitting room the whole logo. So here it's been chopped at ground level. Okay? But if you go in that lovely sitting room, the opposite wall to the TV, there's a beautiful version of it that has the full circle with roots. With roots. Now, you can't see the roots of a plant normally. Only over time do you know they are there and how deep they go from the leaves, from the fruit, and indeed, after hurricanes, yeah? <laughs> Somebody showed me a tree yesterday that had just been turned over, and actually the roots weren't very extensive, which is probably why it didn't survive the hurricane, okay? According to which, the root survives in dry conditions of drought because it can drink very deeply, or in windy conditions of hurricane when it would otherwise be uprooted. It is about roots. Last Easter, after Easter, my husband and I had the glorious privilege of traveling in Senegal, West Africa, because our daughter spent a year doing voluntary work there and it was just the latter portion of her year, a gap year we call it, between high school and university. It's it's more of a British thing than an American thing. But anyway, it, she had a mind-boggling time. But I have never been to West Africa before uh, and was amazed to see, I was so excited, like a little child, to see baobabs. You, you've all learnt about them in your geography lessons. You've all drawn them in your exercise books, right? Massive, thick trunk, sort of funky. It looks like an upside down tree. It looks like what's in the air are the roots. They're so kind of funky. Uh, and, and then I understand under the soil, or the sand, the desert really, you have more under the soil than you can see over the soil. So it, it's kind of the upside down version of, of, of this circle here. Um, so that tree, the baobab, survives, it even thrives through extreme conditions because it has these huge invisible underpinnings. That means at least half of its growth, more than half probably, happens unseen for the sake of its core strength, its stable inner being. 
I throw that out as a challenge. The second metaphor begs us just to, you know, exercise our imagination rather differently. And, and it, in terms of other scriptures, it takes me to the story of Jesus told of the wise and foolish builders. The one who built his house upon the rock and the one who built the house upon the sand. Matthew 7, you know it, back to front, right? Surely both houses at face value looked equally good when they were first finished, perhaps equally impressive, but only the one on the rock survived because its foundations were secure. Again, I often think actually building foundations on rock is jolly hard work. <laughs> much, much harder than digging deep into sand, but there we go. But again, with both of them, you can't see the foundations. You can only see the cracks that happen when something goes wrong. That's why if you're buying a house, do you use the same language we do? We'd get a surveyor, uh, an inspector. In fact, it's obligatory, at least it's obligatory for the insurance companies, if you're gonna, uh, the bank, if you're going to get a mortgage, right? to have the foundations checked out. No matter how good the house looks, no matter how much you want it, you don't buy a place with rubbish foundations because it won't last. I once, I once lived in a two-story, two what you'd call a townhouse, you know, a row of terraced houses. This was in Durham, not the North Carolina Durham, the UK Durham. Uh, where there were four of us students living in every room of the house, one of us in the sitting room downstairs, with one bathroom, not a surprise, but this bathroom had been tacked on to the back of the house. The house was Victorian, built before there were washrooms, and they'd extended the kitchen downstairs and built a bathroom upstairs. Thank the Lord, we didn't have to go outside to it, anyway. Um, the problem is this bathroom extension had sunk so going from my bedroom to the bathroom, I could literally roll in there during the night. That was quite handy to go find the bathroom. But I tell you, every time I had a bath and this house didn't have a shower, I prayed to the Lord that he wasn't going to return while I was in the bath. <laughs> because I somehow thought this whole house is going to collapse if I dare to run the bath, you know, because it's heavy. Oh dear, anyway, I'm still here, and probably that house is still there, but I, I haven't been back. So I recall from a news bulletin a few years back when a Hong Kong skyscraper suddenly collapsed long before 9-11, probably in the early 90s, after an earthquake. And on examination, you saw cross-sectional pictures of the the piles, the pillars that were the foundations of the building, the, the sort of concrete backbone, if you like. You know how they do that now? To, it goes up the whole structure. It's, it, it supports the elevator and everything else, at least with skyscrapers I've seen. Um, and it turned out when you saw the, the rubble of this building that the concrete poured by the builder had been padded out, so it had Coke cans in it. It's particularly the beer cans and Coke cans that I remember, presumably to make the concrete go further, it, you know, to, it, to make it cheaper. And instead of reinforced steel, you had kind of disconnected crappy bits of metal, you know. Not surprising that when push came to shove, you know, when it was threatened, the building keeled over. Friends, the message is really clear for us. It's about <coughs> going deep with quality. Whether it's about the well-rooted plant or the well-built house, Paul is talking about depth, depth that we can't see. It turns out that deeper means Safer, deeper means stronger, deeper means higher. Depth is the counter to superficiality. 
depth is vital for strength and durability. Whatever the external conditions, the inner being is strong and healthy. With a baobab, with a well-built building. We spoke about inner being this morning and how the spirit nurtures strength in that invisible place, which can be quite independent of external circumstances. At the risk of stating the obvious, I just want to point out that we are not simply passive in that process of digging deep. We can attend to our own rooting and grounding where we grow, how we dig, what goes into the concrete, crudely. Resist all special offers that seem available, you know, the quick shortcuts to instant gratification. I suggest to you there's no shortcut to the work of digging and growing. Gratification is all delayed in this process. Our roots and our grounding, our foundations, by the way, isn't just about our seminary credentials. When I became a priest, everything I, I look back was focused on I don't know what you did. I did three years full-time theology. I reveled in it. It was great. And I, we lived and breathed and prayed together and knocked the corners off each other. Yeah. That old-fashioned residential model, you know, the VTS and the Shoda House, Sewanee type model. It was great. But there was a sense, maybe it was just me, but I don't think it was just me, that my job was to be a sponge, to take as many notes as possible, to absorb and learn everything I could, get through the exams with as flying colors as I could, and that would make me a really fantastic priest. <laughs> and what's more, I would be so secure that I wouldn't need to attend to my growing and learning, my digging ever again rubbish. What seminary I have learned is about is about learning how to learn and where to learn so that you never stop learning, so that your hunger grows. It's not about collecting letters, it's not about collecting books, it's not about collecting notes. <laughs> I think of, I'm sorry this is a real diversion, but I think of one fellow student Granted, it wasn't somebody I had much in common with, but he got so cross with uh, those that were lecturing, with the professors, I, I think because th th there were some differences of views. And so he quite readily dismissed the learning and said, I can do better work on my own. And what he did was, he, he had a he had boxes and boxes of those index cards, kind of a bit like roller decks that you used to get. We've dispensed with all of those things now, pretty much, haven't we? And he he spent two and a half of his three years going through the whole of Scripture, kind of text by text. I don't think he really followed the lectionary, but it might have been sort of clumps of verses, as we find in the lectionary reading a commentary and then coming up with on, the, on, on two sides of one index card a kind of summary of what that text was saying. So he said, I've got sermons prepared for the rest of my life. Uh, well, I'm glad you're laughing. I, I mean, I remember it because I just feel the tragedy of that. You're here on this conference in order to attend to your rooting and grounding, I believe, right? Yeah, the invisible stuff that your parishioners will never see. The stuff that happens when your alarm goes off at 5.30 in the morning and it's, well, it probably isn't cold here, it would be in England, but it's dark and you don't really want to get out of bed. 
but, but that invisible stuff that goes on in the, in the study. I've read recently the, uh, a biography of Eugene Peterson and by, uh, by Wynne Collier, he's, he's canonically resident here, right? Um, great book, I recommend it. But it, what was staggering to me about this priest scholar who was always uncomfortable being a priest scholar because he was a priest or a pastor first and foremost was even when his kids were banging on the door how his prayer times continued and he somehow would embrace them or they would watch him in prayer. I mean, it's one or two beautiful stories. I, I can't claim that, but my goodness, I found that very challenging. Okay, gratification is all delayed in this process, but what is it about? Why do we aim to be rooted and grounded? What is the soil in which we're rooted and grounded? Love. It, love, love, love. I wonder, as you read that, what you think the reference to love is about. Is it about our loving? Or could it be a reference back to the love of Christ, the Christ who dwells permanently, throws the suitcase away, who, who takes up residence in our hearts through faith? A literal something, uh, sorry, a literal translation would go something like this. In order that Christ may settle through faith in your hearts, in love, having been rooted and grounded. So uh, I noticed the NIV puts a full stop after, um, after 17a, but the NRSV has 17a and 17b in one sentence. The NRSV is always a closer trans... Um, I've got to be f very careful what I say. It, it pays more attention to the grammar, which is why sometimes in church it's harder to read. Does that make sense? Anyway... Um, that leaves, I think, the question open, being rooted and grounded in whose love? God's or ours? I could let you buzz about this, folks, but I tell you, different commentators lean different side to different sides on that one, okay? I don't think it's clear what the answer is, some get frustrated that they can't pin it down. Perhaps the reference here to faith and love is about our faith and love, our believing and our acting, given that what follows in the next verse, which is all about conceiving the love of Christ, which is at the base of everything. I think there's a principle here about biblical studies, just, just a bit of a diversion. I think there is a discipline attached to where we can't see the answer easily, not to, to over-clarify the answer. It's so tempting when we teach, particularly disciples in our churches, to simplify what's there and give some crystal clear answers, isn't it? People don't want shades of grey. They don't want the fuzzy, the ambiguity. Uh, I, I can't help you on the ambiguity on this one. So just be careful. Just don't be afraid to say, I don't know, because that's what I'm going to say right now. <laughs> and I could quote John Stott for you, which I've got right here. In his commentary, John Stott is the ultimate, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm being a bit sarcastic, but yeah. John Stott on Ephesians lets himself wander into a little e excursus at this point, precisely because of the ambiguity. He asks, if we had the opportunity to ask Paul for what purpose he prayed that Christ would control and strengthen his readers, I think he would reply that he wanted them to be strengthened to love. In the new and recon this is continuing John Stott, in the new and reconciled humanity which Christ is creating, love is the preeminent virtue. The new humanity is God's family whose members are brothers and sisters who love their father and love each other. 
or should do. They need the power of the Spirit's might and of Christ's indwelling to enable them to love each other, especially across the deep racial and cultural divide which previously had separated them. Friends, the context of Ephesians is not very different from the context Bishop Brewer was describing across the Anglican Communion this morning. We need to be strengthened to love through the love of Christ. The context in Ephesians, just to say a little bit more about that, it wasn't the capital of Asia, but it was by far its greatest city. It called itself the first and greatest metropolis of Asia. And it's as if all roads led to Ephesus from the Euphrates and Mesopotamia and Galatia. It was the harbor city, the gateway to the Mediterranean, the highway to Rome. And so it was a marketplace for trade. Think of it as like the Silk Route, if you like. So it became the wealthiest city in Asia, the vanity fair of the ancient world, a free city within the empire. In other words, exempting, ex exempted from having Roman troops in it. It was free. You know what happens when cities are free. It hosted the most famous games in Asia, the, the Olympics of its day, attracting people from all over the province. As you might recall from Acts 19, it was the center of the worship of Artemis or Diana, housing the temple of Artemis, one of the wonders of the ancient world, along with hundreds of <laughs> sacred prostitutes and plenty of criminals seeking asylum, notorious for its immorality and evil. It was a very tribal city, finally, surely very racist, with divisions between the original natives, the colonizing Greeks, and the Jews. Sound familiar? So very modern, even postmodern, we might want to say, with its issues, the international trade, the global village, huge inequalities of wealth, a pluralist society in terms of religion and culture, and also the so-called wars, culture wars that are entailed. Some indigenous racial issues coupled with asylum seekers. Crime and immorality, I've already said, and much of that protected by law. A hot spot for sport and fashion and tourism. Occupied in the sense of being colonized and yet free. So can you feel the tensions and wonder why Paul prays for the Christians to be very well rooted and grounded in love? And this is the point where Paul's focus becomes abundantly clear. He's really specific about what will hold them secure and whose love and I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So for Paul, it is all and only and ever about the love of Christ. I'm reminded of his, I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, 1 Corinthians. Paul prays that they, can I say us, all y'all, <laughs> uh, what was it, use? Use in New York? Use. Use guys. And if I may jump to the French, because that's the other language I know best, vu, not tu, okay? I mean, we're back to all the Lord's holy people, 
All y'all, okay. Um, where are we? May be able to grasp the extent of the love of Christ, which is infinite. What else is there? What else matters? What else can touch tough hearts and tackle the tensions of Ephesian society or our society? Friends, I do not think what we have here is a, is a warm fuzzy. Paul is urging the believers to focus on what God has done for them in Christ. You could call it getting back to basics. Actually, I think I'd want to argue that here is discernment at its richest and most nuanced, which is to say in such a dreadfully powerful yet polarized context where cycles of violence and wickedness are state-sponsored into warring factions, nothing but Christ will cut the ice. The battle is not against human forces, but spiritual forces. Paul expands on that in his final chapter of Ephesians, which you will know, chapter 6, in which context it becomes abundantly clear, in case elsewhere it could be fudged, why nothing short of breaking down the dividing wall of hostility through the blood of the cross brings reconciliation. That's chapter 2 of Ephesians, by the way. Nothing short of breaking down the dividing wall of hostility through the blood of the cross brings reconciliation. God's purpose is to gather all things under the rule and authority and power of Jesus Christ. He said that in chapter 1. That this is happening is demonstrated by God raising Jesus from the dead. Chapter 1, verse 20. Those are the vital facts from which Paul got distracted from his praying that began at the start of the letter. Um, I'm going to resist a full-blown theological treatise on the subject of Christ's work of reconciliation here. But it's all there in the first two chapters of Ephesians. And Ephesians makes clear in the aorist that it is decisive and final and complete. When we talk about the work of reconciliation today, we almost ought to speak of it in the past tense because it's done. We just have to live into it. Do read those two chapters if they're relevant to your context because they provide the hard evidence for the love of Christ. They may be summed up by saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ is reconciliation. Friends, let me just explain that. It's not that the gospel of Christ brings reconciliation, as if it's a really nice sideline, a kind of consequence of the gospel. <laughs> Sorry. Reconciliation is the gospel. The creation of one new humanity under God in one body by the cross. So when Paul longs that we may know the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, this is it. The reconciling love of Christ is the first word and the last word. Now, I've just made a mistake. I plan to throw out the question to you about the length, depth, height, breadth of the love of Christ before I gave you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I'm right and you're wrong, but because I wanted you to explore the height, breadth, length, depth. I'm going to invite you anyway to turn to your neighbor and share with them where you see this. I know you can share where you long for it, 
but I'm asking you where you see it. I hope there are places where you see it in your current context. Okay, two minutes again. Switch around if you haven't already. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to run out of time, and I want to keep galloping if that's okay. Okay? First of all, when it comes to conceiving the love of God, I just want to point out something I've already voiced together with all the Lord's holy people. We're not going to manage it by ourselves. Yeah? We're not going to manage it by ourselves. God's holy people there is a reference back to Isaiah 19 verses 5 and 6, where all the people are gathered at Mount Sinai. It's quoted again over and over again. In, in, in the New Testament, it's all the saints. Saints' day is coming up. You have your sermon right there, okay? So let me ask you, when it comes to conceiving the love of God, where are your horizons? And are they far? Are they wide? And are they flexible? That's kind of where we're going tomorrow, too. It's as if Paul invites us to look at the universe, to the limitless sky above, to the horizons on every side of us to the depth of the earth beneath us and the depth of the seas and he says 
The love of God is as vast as that. In this, he'd be echoing a good few other biblical writers who've stretched the limits of language. We've got hyperbole here for the psalmist and for Habakkuk and a few other places. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. How do the waters cover the sea? They are the sea, you know? So interpreters trying to get their heads around this thought of St. Paul have come up with some wonderful pictures, and I'm just going to give you a couple of them. The ancient commentators are the best. I think they've got, you know, a freed imagination. One of them sees the cross as the literal symbol of this love with the upper arms of the cross pointing upwards, demonstrating the height, the lower arm pointing down to suggest the depth and the crossbar pointing east and west to the widest horizons. Jerome said the love of Christ reaches up to the holy angels, it reaches down to include even the evil spirits in hell, that in length it covers those who are striving on the steep upward path and in its breadth it covers those who are wandering away from Christ. It's good, isn't it? I mean, just let the imagination roll. Or you can work it out theologically and say that in the breadth of its sweep, the love of Christ includes every person of every kind, in every age, in every culture, in every nation, in every century, especially the theme of these chapters, both Jews and Gentiles, in the length to which it would go, the love of Christ accepting even the cross, in its depth, it descended to experience even death and certainly to reach the worst of sinners. And in its height, Christ still loves us in the heaven where he is exalted on high and where he ever demonstrates his love in intercession for us today. Whatever it is, whatever picture you use, Get it that no one is outside the love of Christ and no place is beyond the reach of the love of Christ. Modern commentators would warn us not to get too literal in our interpretation of Paul here. The whole point is that this is rhetoric. You know, it's poetic hyperbole. To get beyond our, our literal capacity, uh, your, your filing cabinet, your index cards, Whatever your conceptual norms are, you need all the saints to comprehend all the dimensions and a lot of strength besides. You need the whole people of God to glimpse the whole love of God. So we spoke earlier about God as the father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. There are further overtones here about inclusion and diversity in relation to the church. Now for Paul, the hot button issue of his day that divided the communion <laughs> had to do with Jews and Gentiles. You know the Council of Jerusalem, right? Mm. Though I'm sure he could have flagged plenty of others on the basis of Ephesus, um, celibates and marrieds was an issue, men and women were issue, Asians and Africans was an issue, Roman citizens and uneducated Galileans was an issue, young and old. And if we're serious about needing the whole people of God to glimpse the whole love of God, then I think we have to jump in with some of our own. What would be our own? Please call some out. What comes to mind? Democrats and Republicans. That's kind of easy, right? Go on, keep going. Liberals and conservatives. Gay and straight. Young and old. Immigrants and citizens, rich and poor. <laughs> Dog lovers and cat lovers. <laughs> Can I keep going sprinklers and immersers? I'm talking about baptism. Do you have that issue? We do, even in the Church of England. The churched and the unchurched. Uh, in, in the Church of England, egalitarians and complementarians. I can explain that if the reader does not understand. 
In North Carolina, it was those that like pork barbecue and those that don't. Duke fans and North Carolina fans. Uh, well, I'm, I'm being a bit f silly now, but we can create division over absolutely anything, can't we? Okay, University of Florida and Florida State. All the saints means not just those that it would be nice to discover more of the love of God through their eyes and their moccasins, whoever the they is, it means we are impoverished if we do not see the love of God through the other. Again, that's what Bishop Brewer said this morning. That's what I heard in the way he was speaking about the divisions in our communion. Yeah. You want to stretch your capacity for grasping the love of God, asks Paul. You won't get there by reason and logic. Paul would never have engaged with the Gentiles on that basis. You have to make the risky journey of encounter. Encounter in which there is opportunity for heart-to-heart -heart connection and conversation, for the sharing of faith and ministry. And that kind of encounter fundamentally has to be incarnate. It has to be embodied. It can begin online. I, we did wonderful things online when we had to, did we not? But I tell you, that Lambeth Conference that Bishop Brewer described this morning could not have functioned online to produce that kind of friendship and fellowship across the reality of the cultural divisions. We call them theological, but the cultural economic divisions actually, I think, are the greatest of all. And in so many ways, the explanation for how we then approach scripture or, or, or persecuted minorities or whatever so differently. Now, I may have lost some of you. I I've got a little political, but you can see it's deep on my heart and it's relevant for me about my sense of calling into the global communion coming up. I'm not sure that we can engage scripture in anything but ways that become political. But I also want to urge you that we allow this word to challenge us personally, spiritually, whoever the you is that is uncomfortable. We need to be made uncomfortable if we're going to learn more about the love of God. Otherwise, we're in our own echo chamber, we're in our own prison, we are confined by people who think like us because we're functioning as if we're insecure, as if the love of God will be challenged, diminished in some way. Friends, no, it can't be diminished, it is. In the gospel of reconciliation, that is where we will discover it and see it all the more. We need to be disturbed. We need to be disrupted if, if our, our horizons are going to be expanded to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So I say to you, wherever discipleship is challenging, go there. Go there to discover more about the love of Christ, not out of pity, but in hunger and humility to learn, to learn and discover. And the point is we cannot get there on our own. We need the other and our horizons need to extend beyond where they otherwise naturally fall. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time. I'm going to leap to the last phrase that you may be Oh, goodness, I'm not even on the last phrase. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. Don't you love that? Yeah. To know what surpasses knowledge. To know the unknowable. Do you hear the tautology? If it surpasses knowledge, how can you possibly know it? In Ephesians, that word surpassing has already popped up twice. Paul loves it. He's so articulate, and yet he gets tied up in knots because words just can't describe or contain God. God's power is surpassing. 
God's, that was 1 verse 19. God's grace is surpassing, chapter 2 verse 7. Now the knowledge of Christ's love is surpassing as well. If at some point you feel the need to sit back and let it all wash over you because you can't cope, because your mind is too small, because your heart is too limited, I quite understand. Indeed, I think you might be very wise in some ways. Go to that Barbados beach and let the waves flood over you. Christ's love is unknowable, just as his riches are unsearchable. I expect we'll spend eternity exploring the inexhaustible riches of the grace and love in Jesus. Yet Paul is still urging us to grow, to draw closer, to go deeper, to be stretched wider. That doesn't necessarily demand that you have to step out boldly to go where no one has gone before. You can do that from your own chair in your own sitting room. God is the kind of God who comes to meet us where we are and stretches us. Remember, he met Moses out in the wilderness in the back of beyond where Moses had run to escape God. God met Isaiah in the place of anxiety. I'm thinking second Isaiah now. In the place where, because God had fallen asleep and disaster had happened, nothing further good could happen. Oh, yes, it could. God meets Miriam in the place of joy. God meets Gideon in the place of confusion where he needs assurance. God meets David in the place of failure. God meets Ruth where she needs security. God meets us where we are according to our needs. And then one thing is overwhelming about the way God meets us. God meets us in a myriad of ways, but every time it is overwhelming because God is bigger God's holiness is greater. God's power is the more terrifying because God's love is the more transforming. And then there is the blessing that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul is urging us to grow with a view to our fullness, our completeness for God's purposes. Fullness is a very Ephesians, Colossians word. Paul tells us God's fullness dwells in Christ. That's the mystery and miracle of the incarnation. Then he says in Christ, we ourselves have come to fullness. And here he prays that we may be filled with the fullness of God as if God can be incarnate in us. That is the shocking possibility. As if, as if we may be the containers for the fullness of God. How about that? The fullness of God? The fullness of God? After we've just heard about how, how absolutely uncontainable is the love of Christ? That is what Paul is praying for us, or for the Ephesians, for us. He's praying that we may become who we are, that we may live into the person God has made us to be, or rather into the body, the community, the communion, the new society which God has made us to be and share together, that we may be filled with the fullness of God with which Christ was filled. God is quite ambitious for us. <laughs> to live in us, to work through us, for his image to be shaping and empowering all that we are. So that is something about the potential of our humanity under God. More about that tomorrow. Sorry, I've run five minutes over. Where is Cynthia? Let's have some questions. Um, I wouldn't call it. Oh my goodness, they were tough questions earlier. These are Give not softballs. <laughs> oh. I'm just warning you, and I did not write them. Let's start. How should our understanding of Christ's once and for all work of reconciliation affect our understanding of absolution in our liturgy? You have a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Christ's, 
Christ is... Uh, you want me to repeat that question? <laughs> I'm going to get Cynthia to repeat it in that case, because I'll get it okay, wrong. Okay, you ready? How should our understanding of Christ's once and for all work of reconciliation affect our understanding of the absolution in our liturgy? So Christ is reconciling the world unto himself. Christ has once for all reconciled the world unto himself, but Christ is still at work tying up the loose ends. Do you know, this is a very British expression, but the difference between V, let me get this right, D-Day and V-Day. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at history, can you tell? <laughs> Second World War language. The war ended on, uh, somebody can help me with the date, uh, not very good. But because of the continuing issues in Japan, actually, you will know about those. <laughs> there was a gap of many months before V-Day, before victory could be celebrated, but the war had already been resolved. That's how I understand the gap we live in between the once for all reconciliation of Christ and the work of Christ tidying up the mess. Woo, out of the ballpark. Okay. Beautiful. Quote, to know this love that surpasses knowledge <laughs> most regularly occurs in the place of grief mm -hmm. where there aren't words. Mm -hmm. Is this by God's design? <sighs> that gets to the question of suffering, doesn't it, mm -hmm. in our world? Um, I'm just trying to think what the text is for Sunday that I'm preaching on. It's Lamentations, the steadfast love of... Uh, probably others are preparing these same texts, I don't know. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, Jesus being called to the death of Lazarus. Do you care, Jesus, effectively? And Jesus' reply is... Come and, um, I'm not going to get the wording quite right, come and see the glory of God being revealed. Mm. Now, it's not clear at that point that the glory of God is going to be revealed in resurrection. The glory of God is Jesus going to the tomb of a dead man over whom Mary and Martha are weeping. Okay? I, I seriously believe the glory of God is revealed when Christians are willing to engage in the pain of the world. Mm. When we don't shirk it, shun it, hide from it, or resolve it too quickly. That's right. It, it's about being with, you know, Emmanuel, mm -hmm. okay? This is the God we serve. Our job is not to fix. That's mm -hmm. Jesus' job, yeah? So I do think the glory of God is revealed in suffering, just as the ultimate glory of God is revealed in, you know, the resurrection reality. But in the meantime, let's not take too short a cut to it and let's not be blind to the glory of God in, in pain. Mm. Beautiful. All right, well, this I, is... I uh, just prepared that sermon for Sunday. You can listen <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> this, there are a number of questions in the one question, so I might have to go over it twice. Once we've experienced the depth and establishment, Paul's prayer is again that we have power. What is that power? Does it reference the later grasping? And if so, how does that power lead to mm -hmm. understanding slash knowledge in a tangible way? So what is the power? Does it reference grasping? How do we reach understanding and knowledge in a tangible way. Uh, I mean, I'm really clear the power is what Paul has described in Ephesians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. The power is uh, the savior of the world willingly going to the cross to die, to break down the dividing wall of mm -hmm. hostility. Th there is our power. 
Then the next part was about grasping. Mm -hmm. You know, grasping is a word that has other connotations, doesn't it, for us, about sort of the illegitimate exercise or, or search for power mm -hmm. and clinging on. I have to say, I'd have to do my homework here on the word grasping, which is not something I delved into. But to grasp the love of Christ, there's nothing illegitimate there, but there is, somebody just voiced it, a clinging on. Yeah. A and, I, and I suppose an assumption that, hey guys, please try, but you'll never quite manage it fully because you're just flaky, shaky human beings. You know, you just, y you can't conceive <laughs> how high and deep and wide and what's the other one, long, mm -hmm. is the love of Christ. But, but give it a go. Give it a go, mm -hmm. and it'll keep you going. Yeah, so just to repeat, it, it, it's not something we do on our own, it's something Christ has first done to us. I think, thank you, that, that is the logic here, if it, if, yeah. But, but we're still clinging onto the coattails, aren't we, as, as Christ flies, you know. I mean, I, I mean, another image which I didn't use, but I thought about, was the prodigal and the father. You know, talk about paying homage that we started with this morning. The prodigal comes on his knees to the father, but the father is the one who comes running before the prodigal ever found his knees, the father started running because he saw him in the distance. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I do think the prodigal has to cling on to the father's coattails. The prodigal can't cope, you know, is overwhelmed. But the father's overwhelming is far greater and unstoppable, you know. So the prodigal has to get over himself, <laughs> to quote my phrase. Okay. Next one. Sorry, I just I had to giggle at one of them, but we're going to ask another one first. Um, how, oh. do you, <laughs> how about being rooted and established in love by our baptism? Can you relate being rooted and established in love to T baptism? To the imagery of baptism. Mm -hmm. hmm, that's being immersed in love, isn't it? Mm. Being drowned in, kind of. Now, I'll have to think about that one a bit more. Can I just say one other thing that I wanted to say about Rooted and Grounded, and I realized I forgot. I thought about it in regard to your hurricanes and the trees that get uprooted. Um, the most, uh, we talk about resilience a lot. Do you talk about resilience too? Mm -hmm. And I've, I've really struggled to find a definition for resilience and find it in scripture. I think you find much more perseverance, endurance kind of language in scripture. But on the basis of, of this text, I think we're talking about the elasticity that comes from, I'm thinking of the organic tree rather than the building now, but I guess in California it's relevant too for buildings that have been earthquake-proofed, right? That, that they can swing in the wind without breaking. Well, <laughs> somebody's a little bit skeptical. I mean, th there are limits. Uh, palm trees are good at that, are they? Mm -hmm. I mean, sh sure, there are limits to resilience, but I just want to, to give you that image of elasticity and mm -hmm. flexibility mm -hmm. that I think theologically goes an awful long way as well. You know, when we get defensive, we get brittle. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm right and you're wrong, or there's only one way of looking at this. It's, it's, it's not both and, it's either or. Uh, somebody, if somebody's right, somebody else has to be wrong, all that kind of stuff. I, I don't think you get, I think, I think the image of the elasticity and flexibility just challenges some of that. And, and I think post-COVID, that, that's, that's been some of my thinking and my care for clergy in our diocese um, ab about growing resilience. So I just offer that to you. Sorry, and then Beautiful. there was a ridiculous question that you were well, just a comment. I wanna, holding I wanna till honor last. Everybody. So I consider these comments, according to Paul, we are holy, all the Lord's holy people, 
but we don't really see ourselves as holy. We want to be holy. And here's the last question. Christ has broken down the wall of hostility. In the varsity match, who would you support? Oxford or Cambridge? <laughs> <laughs> There's only one answer to that. You know. <laughs> Cambridge, because I went to Cambridge, right? <laughs> Thank you. But it's a game. <laughs> it's a game. It's a boat race. Thank you very much. I we just appreciate can your time. I just can I just challenge that that question about the Lord's holy people? I just Please. need to warn you. You could be you could get a PhD dissertation here <laughs> because this was my topic, exploring holiness in the Old Testament. And then I ended up in 1 Peter 2, where he quotes directly from Exodus 19, although he flips the order around. I just want to challenge it because it is a little bit like that question about reconciliation and absolution. God declares his people at the point of making the covenant, you will be to me a royal priesthood and a holy nation or a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. And then they all shout, yeah, yeah, we'll listen, we'll do everything you say. And hunky-dory, the covenant is signed, sealed and delivered. And of course, two minutes later, they're melting down their jewelry and they're breaking every <laughs> commandment under the sun. Um, God has declared his people to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And at the same time, we are living into that identity. That there is, again, the already and the not yet of the kingdom of God there. So when you're preaching all saints in a couple of weeks' time, I, I, I don't think the one denies the other. You know, we just, again, we have to have that kind of flexible... Why am I even holding this? Because I've got this microphone. <laughs> I'm so confused. We have to have that flexibility of spirit that says... Yes, we are God's holy people. It's utterly mind-blowing what that means and what God is risking in terms of investing his holiness in us, in, in flaky, shaky human beings. But that is our God who, who works through us in partnership in the gospel despite the fact that we drop the ball all the time. God is so patient. I mean, it's ridiculous. And at the same time, God patiently works with us. Every time we break the pieces, God bends down, picks them up, glues them together, and off we go again. And even then says, in the cracks, I will shine my light so that you glimpse my holiness even more starkly. That is the grace of God. Amen. <laughs>